And good afternoon. Very warm welcome to Deering Live on Thursday, July 13th. It's a pleasure to be here, pleasure to be back. Uh, and unfortunately for you, lovely people, you are left with me today. I asked Dave if he wanted to be here. He said there was so much talent in this room today that he couldn't possibly live up to that he backed out and took a break for the afternoon. Uh, and you'll see why in just a second when we bring in our guests. So I'm, uh, I'm super happy to be here. I'm super excited. Um, thanks for tuning in. Happy 4th of July, belated. I hope everybody had a safe and, uh, and wonderful just long weekend of, of fireworks and fun with family, etc. Um, celebrating all things July 4th. Sometimes ironic with the person with my accent, but it is one of my favorite holidays. So uh, you can assure that. Uh, I also want to give a quick shout out to a wonderful lady who I spoke to on the phone today, Margie Scora, if you're watching. Uh, she called in asking about uh, videos and Deering Live and, and some Michael Miles stuff that we had made. Uh, and just the sweetest, sweetest lady and had a wonderful conversation with her. So I promised I'd give her a shout out if she tunes in. So hopefully she tuned in today. Thank you, Margie. All right, let's jump on in because we've got a lot of ground to cover today. Um, I don't really need to make any major introductions. So I think we're going to crack right on with the show uh, because I'd like to bring in Mr. Jens Kruger, Mr. George Grove, and our very own Mr. Greg Deering right off the bat. Where's he at? There they are. Hello. Hello, everybody. How are we doing? <laughs> doing really well. <laughs> Always. He promised he wouldn't play. Like he, he sat there in soundcheck with a banjo kind of out of shot, like he wasn't holding anything, and then he would just start playing. And that's just yeah, 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 yeah. Play like it's over, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. But he can't help it. It's like a stress ball. It's always, it's always well, on his side. Yeah, it's a, well, it's so good to see you all. Wonderful. It's great to see you guys. And uh, Greg, how are you feeling? Doing well, doing, doing well. well. Two doors down from where I'm sitting right now. That's awesome. Yeah, just a few feet from you. Jens is out in North Carolina and George Grove. I'm in Las Vegas, well, that's where nice. we're going to be hitting of 118 degrees here. So warm. We're, we're, we're approaching 100 today. Yeah, it's warm. How's, it, it's how's the weather doing in, in North Carolina? It's not that bad. I think it was in the high, it was in 95, about, you know, 90, 92, something like that. So it wasn't bad at all. It wasn't, wasn't so bad yet. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Let's, let's try and stay uh, hydrated and, and cool, shall we? In this, uh, in this definitely warm. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Coffee. <laughs> Absolutely. 100%. All right. Let's get started. Here's, uh, here's where I want to go first. Um, the two, uh, Jens and Greg in particular, you've been on here a couple of times and, you know, we know who you guys are. So just at the beginning, I want to talk to the guest who has not been on this show before, which is Mr. George Grove and get to know you a little bit. Um, cause this whole thing is one of the first times that you and I have interacted really in any kind of detail. So it's been a really fun process, but take me back, let the audience, let everyone know, you know, what was your beginning as far as music and the banjo like, and, and kind of where did that come from and, and talk me through those those early days well when i was growing up in the mountains of north carolina not very far from where Jens is i didn't have toys lying around the house we had musical instruments lying around the house and my father uh who had played uh trombone and trumpet in order to get through college um had all of these things out for us to experiment with piano is what i gravitated to so i began taking piano lessons at four uh, at about the age of 10, 11, I first heard the Kingston Trio, and I was immediately uh, excited by the sounds of the guitars and the banjos and the harmonies and the excitement. Mm -hmm. But that's what turned me on to those stringed instruments. So I um, had wonderful instruction on piano and trumpet, but there wasn't a whole lot of call for folk trumpet. So I, con I continued uh, to experiment on my own with the guitar and with the banjo and had folk groups, uh, went off to college, still had a folk group, um, was able to go to a USO show over to Germany with one folk group, another USO show to Alaska with a different folk group. I graduated from college. I was drafted into the army. I was injured, which was a saving grace for me because it put me out of the infantry and into the army band. And I played trumpet and piano in the army band, still playing the guitar and the banjo in a folk group. Uh, when I got out of the army, I went to Nashville to become the next big star. 
but I arrived on the same bus that had 10,000 other guys arriving to be the next big star. And uh, that was the early 70s when country music was really uh, prolific and it was taking off in a new direction. Uh, the old guard, Roy Acuff and, and um, uh, Ernest Tubb and Loretta Lynn, they were all still there, but it was taking a new direction with people like Larry Gatlin. And I was there for about uh, four years. I learned a lot. I got to play backstage at the Grand Ole Opry because uh, as a musician over at Opryland, we had access to the new Grand Ole Opry house. And all the musicians got to know each other. And they would say, oh, I don't want to go on the road with Johnny Cash this weekend. George, can you go out and play rhythm guitar? Let me check my schedule. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of a no-brainer. And I had uh, a wonderful time learning as much what not to play as what to play. Uh, then in 1976, I was called by the Kingston Trio to audition. And I was in line with a few other guys around the country and they chose me wow. um, and I was with the group for 41 years <laughs> and that's, that's pretty much. Um, that, my, was, that was the thing, right? That, that was, was and what, what a, like a very, very similar story. I feel like I've heard that story multiple times, but from somebody else and that, that, that someone else is just to your left there. Uh, Greg Deering, like again, Kingston mm -hmm. Trio providing that anchor for what was the excitement about those instruments, right? The string instruments, the banjo and the guitar. Greg, does that, that sound familiar to you, or was your pursuit of folk trumpet a little bit more well, aggressive? Well, I, I did, did play the trumpet uh, in junior high and high school. Um, never in the orchestra or anything like that, but my main thing was, was um, when I discovered that the Kingston Trio had a whole album. Initially, I all we had in our house was a 45 of the Peter on a Jail because that song actually was written about an actual incident that happened in Tijuana. And some friends of my parents went to the event and ended up in the Tijuana Jail. And hence the song <laughs> came out. So they had the 45, but I didn't know the albums existed until a few years later. And at that point, my friend had a guitar and we had the album. So I had to get a banjo, and I have not looked back since. So when when did you two, and Jens, I'm going to come to you in just a second, but um, Greg and George, with the love of the Kingston Trio, kind of on a, on a trajectory that would ultimately bring you two together as well as as, uh, as friends, as well as kind of business associates. Was it the, was it the buyout of the Vega brand uh, that kind of allowed you guys to cross paths, or did you know each other before that? No, it was before that. Uh, okay. I moved out to San Diego. Uh, in the mid '80s, and because I was so close to the Deering Mancho factory, I would go out and spend some time with Greg and Janet. And at one point, Greg said, "We need to build you a banjo." So I started bringing hundred dollars here, fifty dollars there, two hundred dollars there, and finally, Greg said, "George, we've got enough money. We need to build that banjo." <laughs> that's, so, the, that's Greg, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he uh, he said, I found a beautiful piece of, of wood and he showed me this uh, wonderful block of maple. And he said, when this is uh, ironed out, it's going to be a beautiful piece of tiger stripe maple. And that became the neck for my first banjo from the Deerings, which is the banjo Saurus, which has uh, a little bit of fame on, on uh, the Deering banjo site. Yeah. And yep. Chuck cut the uh, was it Chuck, uh, Greg, that cut all the pieces and the? Well, he cut it, he cut about half of them. I cut about half of mm -hmm. them. We we both worked on it. And Jeremiah, your son, did the artwork for the headstock. Yep, yep. Oh, By the I time know. I got all the artwork done for the fingerboard, I just couldn't figure out the pig head. Everything I drew just didn't didn't add up. But handed it to Jeremiah, and in twenty minutes he had the perfect pig head. And that banjo is in the museum, isn't it, right now? Or is it back with you for a no, while? It's back, it was... it's back with me. It was with the museum for about two years. But uh -huh. uh, I needed it. <laughs> I mean, it's a wonderful <laughs> instrument. It has a wooden tone ring. Uh, one of the things that that instrument taught me was to listen to music again. Uh, I became, as so many of us do, um, in the habit of looking at the fret markers. 
Mm -hmm. And there are no fret markers on the Banjo Saurus. You know, it's just a beautiful mural of dinosaurs and volcanoes and rivers and forests and mountains. And I thought, where am I? Uh, I know how to determine where I am. I'll listen again. You know, and that brought me back to the reason for playing music in the first place. It sounds good. Yeah, that that it brought you back 50, 50, 65 million years. <laughs> and, and, but you know, there's a there's a beautiful there's a beautiful story, you know, of Greg. Uh, I, I'm sorry to jump in like that, but okay. but Greg, you know, you once told me the story that when you were a kid and you wanted a Vega banjo and you saw mm. a long neck banjo in a in a in the music store, and with a pretty rude, you know, uh, a salesperson there at the time, and anyway. It's so funny. You couldn't afford the banjo, you know. That's how life goes. And now you're building Vega banjos, you know. You own the company, and I think that's just uh, just a marvelous story, you know. Of you never know when you're young, you know, where things go, and and uh, there's there's so much that can happen. And uh, if you work on it and do your thing, and you definitely have, Greg. You know that story always stuck with me. You know, you yeah. marvel yeah. at that banjo. And it's been an amazing journey. Not only do I make the Vega banjos now, but I've got to virtually know all the guys that are, were in the Kingston Trio, make George his banjo, um, both of his, a number of his banjos. He's got more than one. And uh, it's just, if you would have told me that when I was 15, that I would get to do that and be part of the whole music world like this, it would have been unbelievable. But yeah. here we are. Well, I need to and jump I in here. I work with the ants too. I have a, uh, um, several, as you alluded to, I have several, like about 15 <laughs> during banjos. <laughs> uh, many of them good times. but uh, and, and several of them are very, very nice custom banjos that you built. But my, one of my, two of my favorites... Uh, involved 10 years ago when I was getting ready to have uh, a total shoulder replacement um, in Salt Lake City because they have good surgeons up there. And the night before, you, Greg, and some dear friends of mine and John Cavanaugh had all colluded, uh, much to my surprise, to uh, get me out to dinners where I met, first met John Cavanaugh. And then we went over to my friend's house and John said, oh, Help me carry these banjos in. I think you'd, you'd like to look at these. I just thought they were banjos that I would like to look at. Opened them up. It turns out that uh, Greg and Janet had uh, conceived of and built for me two different banjos. One a standard length and the other one a long neck banjo. Both on the good time frame, uh, which is much, much lighter than what uh, I, I'm accustomed to, you know, with the tone ring. Because they knew that after the surgery, I would not be able to handle That's right. a, a, a full size banjo. Mm -hmm. And to, to this day, I think of the, uh, every time I play those banjos, I think of the love that went into them in the building and, and the love that came my way when they presented them to me. Yeah, that's I, I can feel very much with you on that. I, I, you know, I used to be out in the company and I had a nice banjo, you know, that uh, Greg and Janet had built for me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, But you know they had these beautiful instruments, and one you know once once I saw one that was gold plated and it looked marvelous, and it had all these things in it, you know, and I was just I said, "Ah, oh, this is beautiful," you know. And then I don't know, it was a few years later, you know, we were at an event in Nashville, and they they just made me a banjo, and it was so sparkly, beautiful. When I opened the case, I closed it instantly again because it was a It was like a shock, you know. I said, "Well, I can't go on stage with this. What are, go what are people going to think of me? You know, with an instrument so beautiful." And uh, and well, I took it with me. And after after a while, you know, uh, I played it all the time, and it sounded so good. It was just, you know. And then Uwe Uwe, actually, my brother, he 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 said to me once. He said, "You're playing nice music, and you're playing with symphonies. You're doing all these things. You should you should play that instrument. You know, if you like it that much, and people will." We'll appreciate it, you know, looking at it. And that's when I started playing it. And it became my banjo. Of course, today, now you can see it's got all kinds of wear, you know, and it's been, but it's been my banjo, you know, for all these years now. So um, I'm very, very, very high. So I can feel very much with that. There's a certain kind of, I don't know, like when you get a nice instrument, you there's almost like, am I worthy to play it? 
right? Yes, and it's that, actually that's how I felt. That's, that's a thing. I, 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 I've done I, that. Mm -hmm. I, very much how I felt. And, uh, and But you uh, tell, you know, uh, George, you have a very special long neck, Banjo, because as I understand, you have one fret less than a regular long neck, Banjo. Or so is, is, I, I'm going to stop you right there just for a second because I do want, I want to, I want to talk about the long necks before we jump into that. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, 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 you're fine. <laughs> Jens is running the show, but I do want to get this down, right, because... The long neck's cool, and, and actually, because I deal a lot with the artist relations side as well, and there's a, there's a slowly growing number of younger artists coming to us going, hey, I want to try a long neck. I really like the sound of it. I like the tuning of it. This is really cool. But they don't necessarily know the history of it, right? And, you know, George, obviously, you know, you're, you're a long neck guy, and Greg, I know you, you have a bit of a passion for the long neck world, um, and yet it remains kind of a bit lesser known compared to what Jens is holding, which we would all consider to be kind of a dare I say standard, even though it's not, but it's, as far as dimensionally speaking, it's what we all know to be a, yes, a five-string sure. banjo right now. So, uh, George, I want to start with you. Um, what's a long neck banjo and where does it, give us some, for anyone at home who doesn't necessarily know what it is, what it's about, uh, give us the, the lowdown. Greg could probably give you a better history than I. Uh, the first time I was aware of a long neck banjo was uh, through Pete Seeger. Um, and I always thought that he, I initially thought that he had that long neck banjo because he was tall. <laughs> 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 but I, I think it had a lot to do with the uh, range of a male voice um, because the long neck banjo has a foundation of a fundamental in the key of E uh, being three frets lower than a standard length banjo. Mm -hmm. And uh, that permitted, you know, so many guitar players uh, play in the key of E all the time. It's just the first chord that you ever learn for some reason. Um, because the sixth string is an E. So the fundamental is an E. And uh, am I close to it, Greg, as you understand it? Well, and the basic is what the instrument is. It's three three more frets on the lower end of the neck. And that was invented, not just Pete Seeger played it, but he invented it. Hmm. And he took an old Vega standard link five string to D'Angelico in New York and had him splice in those three frets. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Explain totally. that. Is that he literally just cut the peg head off and built in? Cut it in a piece. And, then they, and there was a drawing of that in Pete Seeger's original uh, banjo lesson book. Yeah, that's right. I remember that. I heard to D'Angelico doing that for him. And then, then Eric Weisberg, who was a student of his, took it one and had it done. Mm -hmm. And uh, But not too long after that, the Vega company came to Pete and asked him if they could do a Pete Seeger model. And Pete told me the story that he said, sure, I don't care. He says, I didn't, Pete Seeger said, I didn't think they'd sell any, so it didn't matter to me at all. It wasn't until years later that he found out that they'd sold thousands of them. And um, so the original ones were, were, were grafted next by D'Angelico, but then Vega started making them. Mm -hmm. But the one that Pete played in his later years was a banjo that he and some friends put together on an old 20s Vega tubophone pot, and the neck was made out of solid lignum vita. Um, <laughs> and it was heavy and clunky and um, a little bit twisted, but... Peter made a lot of magic on that banjo. That's that's a cool story. I really uh, like that. Yeah, it's a, and and as I understand, right, the fifth. If you put the capo on the third fret, you're actually having a regular banjo, yep. and then the, and then the fifth string is actually actually on the fifth fret. You know, looking from the third fret. You know. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah. it's like a red. So it's like a regular banjo, really. And then yep. and also, you know, in order to counterweight. You know the banjo holding. Beat Seeker had the strap button. You know in the middle. You know somewhere along the neck. You know so he had he had the strap button inside here somewhere. So um. so the banjo so the banjo would hang on here, not not on the like here. So otherwise you know the neck would always you know pull the banjo down. So he had had it somewhere here, and. Uh, so he, he he would hold it, and also you know you also have to hold it more to the side, otherwise you can't reach the. The chords, right? <laughs> <laughs> An eyeball put in at about the eighth fret. 
Oh, know? the the the, the IO loop for the strap. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we've we've done that for a few customers, but most customers don't want us to do that. No. Yeah. Well, whenever whenever I play a long neck, the thing that throws me off the most is uh, because of that um, Pete Seeger story. Your your I I look at side dots instead of fret markers. So the side dots would traditionally be at one three five, and on a long neck it shifts right. It goes to like two four six. Yes. So wherever it's, you it's, think your hand position is supposed to be, it's not. You have to be. You have to look at it completely differently. To George, you you find that as well. Uh, probably not now, but was that ever a struggle or going back and forth between standard five strings and, and long necks? Only on the banjo saurus, you know, where you had to, mm. uh, as I said before, <laughs> yeah. you had to start listening to music again instead of mm. looking where you were going. Mm -hmm. um, no, Greg. Greg has done a marvelous job of of uh, incorporating everything that a banjo player needs to look at, so that he can listen, you know, and mm. and be pleased with what he hears. But what you said about the uh, what Yin said about the weight of the banjo drawing it down and and uh, it's it's just so long leads us into why I have a compromised long neck banjo with only two additional frets instead of three. Uh, I went to Greg and I said. I break a lot of strings on the stage and I'm so short, I'm having difficulty reaching all the way to the peg head and changing a string because you have to reach with two hands sometimes to tie it off. Yes, sir. So I said, let's do a banjo that only has two additional frets. And the more I started thinking about that, I thought, well, the fundamental of a regular long neck banjo is E, which is four sharps. So it's a bright key on a bright instrument. Mm -hmm. If we do two additional frets, the fundamental will be a half step higher. It'll be the key of F. It has one flat, which is traditionally felt to be a warm key. Anything with a flat is supposed to have a warmer sound. Mm -hmm. So what will it be like to have a warm fundamental on a bright instrument? And, of course, we put uh, Jens' tone ring in it, and that made a big difference. I, I can play immediately uh, much better. <laughs> <laughs> just knowing his tone ring was in it um, <laughs> well i didn't know you had that tone ring in this is the the Roischke tone ring that we the, the Ritchie, yeah from switzerland yeah. yeah yeah well that's that's a great tone ring my goodness yeah but the awesome. uh, the banjo is heavy i'll, I'll get, give you that <laughs> but uh, the other thing that we did with that banjo uh cosmetically was I had, of course, all the autographs of all the members of the Kingston Trio. And I asked Greg if there was a way that he could incorporate that into the neck of the banjo. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, I happen to have it here. What? The, uh, <laughs> here we go. See, uh, it magically appeared. Just, I just happen to have it. Look at that. Huh? So Greg has the Kingston Trio down here. And he actually used a real rope to do the hangman's noose. He tied all 13 knots and the rope goes all the way up the neck. He cut a groove and put the, the rope all the way up the neck of the banjo to, I'm getting hung up here. Hold on a second. Oh, banjos and cables. To the, <laughs> to the headstock. And interesting thing about the headstock, it has all of these white oak leaves. That's the tree from which Tom Dooley was hung. Uh, or hanged in uh, North Carolina. And yes, your old sound man, Philip, is the one who went out and scanned a white oak leaf and sent it to Greg so that he could make the little abalone inserts. Yes, that's what he did. That's what he did. I, I, like, I like the tuners, you know. You have the tuners, you know, coming out to the side. Um, I saw that, you know, with Eric Weisberg. He always had that. And, and also, uh, of course, Pete Seeger. And I like that, you know, because they're, they don't look traditional, but they actually work much better. And you know, for 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 the the folk music, you know, they they just look right. You know, I think they they look. I'm always tempted actually to put them on my banjo or at least one of my banjos. Well, this okay. banjo started out with regular uh, planetary pegs. Yes, but uh, Greg convinced me that uh, I might like it better if we went to the uh, to the Grover style tuning mm -hmm. machinery because I had a, a better ratio for tuning. Absolutely. And it's the tuning is so much better. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're fantastic tuning pegs, you know? Well, it is for some people, but you, <laughs> you have to be able to tune <laughs> either way. One of the things with a banjo, you have to retune. Do you retune your banjo a lot when you play? 
I do because I use the capo a lot and that'll pull the string down. So uh -huh. I try to use as little tension as I can with the capo yeah. and then just barely retune. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's hard to find a good tuner for the banjo. But I I found this one, which it's a good area here, one. It's a yes, sir. Yeah, it's a good area. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, I, so I use it. I use it here. I put it. I put it on the headstock, right, right here. You see. That's the clip-on uh -huh. one. Yeah. That, that's the same. It's but it's the same. It's the same. Um, I think it's the same uh, a tuner. Yeah, it's I think just, it's a Diderio, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's the Diderio. Yeah. And there's I, a clip on I, one, and there's one that's designed to sit on the rim. It sits underneath the hooks, I think. And it yeah, has a that's the one I have. Yeah, yeah it's I, great. I, it's easier uh, for me to tune with the one that sits between the brackets mm. because the sound doesn't have to travel all the way up the neck of the banjo and mm. then go to the tuner. Sometimes that didn't work too well for me. <laughs> Maybe because I had a capo on the neck also. Yeah, I was always under, under the impression that you tuned the banjo down to E anyway, and then just tuned up. You know, you know, even though even though you just had two frets, I didn't know you just put it down to F. I thought you put it down to E. Just no, I, I do keep it at F. Uh, okay. Right. My partners always tell me that I do what uh, most banjo players do, and I find the one string that's out of tune, and then I tune to that. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> when, when I'm on stage, you know, with tuning, there's always some joke coming from either Uwe or Joel, you know. <laughs> some, we'll kind of, that. Some, kind we'll that. some kind of banjo joke will come, you know. <laughs> we'll, we'll add that to the list of alternate tunings that we have on the site. It's just like the, the, the find the one that's out of tune tuning. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yes, yeah. did you ever get involved with long neck banjos at all? Are you? Well, no, actually, you actually, my that? my involvement with long neck banjos actually was at dear at, at, at Greg's home. You know, Greg and Janet. Mm -hmm. You know, they I, I I stayed there many nights. You know, and let me they let me stay there, and and uh, you know we worked together. You know, on banjos, and uh, Greg had always long neck banjos. You know that that I could try, and you know yeah. old ones, and you know that he that he had, and. Yeah, I said it was the same like you, Jamie. You know, I would get completely confused. You know, the first few minutes, so ah, you know, I can't play at all anymore. You know, this is terrible. But I was always fascinated when I was a, when we were kids. You know, we had an album that was country and western, you know, music, and they had Chad Atkins on and Hank Snow and all kinds of people. And there was a, a young guy, you know, standing there and a few people around, and he held a long neck banjo. So when I was a kid, I thought that's the regular banjo so when i first saw banjos in music stores i thought all oh, their necks were too short you know because mm -hmm. i only knew that and also then we had the pete seeger songbook and in the back you can see pete seeger you know sitting on a tree and there's children around it's one of his camps and i always loved that picture because it reminded me of our home because we sat you know with our parents and they would sing and we pl play uh, guitars and we'd sing you know sit around and that was just a, such a peaceful picture and you know he holds that long neck so i'm sort of you know had this imprint of long neck banjo in me and i was a little disappointed that my banjo didn't have that long neck you know when i first got my my first banjo and i thought they were all wrong you know the, the long ones are the right ones and uh, of course then I, then I learned different but i'm absolutely fascinated with the long neck and i always actually wanted one you know i always wanted the long neck to try you know because i think because it's the string length the string you know, just vibrates like almost like a monochord. You know, the, the strings has a different overtone structure. It sounds sweeter, you know, on, on, on a long on a long neck. If that string is so long and you start playing it, it sounds it sounds amazing. It's it's a different it's a different sound altogether. It's it's not just like you're tuning a banjo down, you know, that mm -hmm. that has a good sound. But if the neck's longer and the strings longer and you have that same kind of tension it's 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 amazing you know what happens to the string and the overtones so it just it feels beautiful and every time i play in uh, uh, any of the uh, long neck banjos you know it doesn't matter if it's got a tone ring or not you know uh, or what kind of tone it's, it's just the way the string vibrates when i go back to my regular banjo i feel like woo this doesn't sound good <laughs> you know i have to get i have to get used to it again you know okay. is, is it, Jimmy, yes. that, yes, that means that we need to put in a, a work order to get a long neck 
to Jens. No, 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 I didn't mean it that way. Don't die. Uh, yeah. I was, I was, I was. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you. Uh, yeah, yeah, we can, we can definitely do that. That's no problem. I, I, but I, I do have a question about it though, because we, we, as you know, we make the Julia Bell right, which is intentionally a low tuned instrument. I think we go down to D and E. That's mm -hmm. Alison Brown's. Uh, sure. Banjo. When you go down to an E on something like a Julia Bell, which is a standard scale length. Does it feel and sound different to a long neck, in your opinion? Is it a completely different beast at that point? It is. Or? It is because, because you know, to, to tune down to E, you know, on a regular band, you've got to thicken up the strings. Well, yeah. I mean, the Julia Bell you know, and, 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 and so you actually have a thick string that sounds low, and that has a complete different overtone spectrum mm -hmm. than a regular string, you know, being longer. So, yeah. and that makes it a really different instrument. You know, it sounds very, it sounds vastly different, you know, and mm -hmm. that, it has an intriguing richness that, you know, that, that you're going to, I always start missing, you know, if I, right. if I go back and I have to excuse really uh, huge thunderstorms coming through and I just have to get some stuff of my, do you hear that? Oh yeah. 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 You go ahead and, and, and I just and have jump. to clear something off my porch, you know, Jonathan, Otherwise we'll pull you out gonna... for a second. And then when you yeah. come back in, we'll bring no, you back. No, no, no. Be, be safe, sir. Jens will leave his thing off of, uh, or not mute his channel ever. So we'll, uh, we'll pull him out for a minute. <laughs> well, that kind of uh, that kind of what Jens was talking about with the string length and the uh, and the roundness of the sound really fits right into the style of music that I play, which is more folk. Uh -huh. um, bluegrass, I think, has a lot more bending of strings, and what I do is the uh, a more folky style. And I'm playing with a capo at uh, the first position. I play all the way up to with a capo on the. Uh, um, 11th fret wow. and it's difficult to find a string gauge that sounds good because uh, you want that larger string uh, with that rounder sound when you have the full length of the neck to play but then when you put the capo on you're in effect uh, changing it to a more standard length banjo and even shorter so I'm constantly trying to experiment I'm asking Greg all the time what does Yin say? <laughs> what's, what's his play? And uh, I'd experiment with those strings. They, in fact, I went to uh, an eleven on the first string because of what Yin said. You need more uh, mid tones uh, out of that string rather than a. You've got a storm moving. That's a, that's a there. storm coming through. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You can hear that. Can we have yeah. some of that? We really need the rain here in Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's... But there's one song that. Uh, above all others, a little closer. Yeah, uh, is the most right now for me is the most important song that I play on the long neck banjo using the, the full scale of the long neck, um, and this may lead us into another segment, and it's forever in a day. And all right. I think it's one of the most powerful songs that I've ever heard for its content, but it has taught me so much musically, and made me extend musically. And then it sounds so good on the long neck banjo. Oh, so this does segue quite beautifully because I will say one of my favorite stories that Greg has told me, particularly lately, uh, on, on many different occasions over the years, is the moment that I think George, you called Jens to tell him, or at least ask permission, or to let him know that you wanted to cover uh, "Forever in a Day," the Cougar Brothers song. So, Greg, give us give us that that story as it was from your eyes well when i when jan and i were visiting Jens, we were sitting in his his living room when the phone rang and Jens went and got the phone and came back in a little while and he actually had a little bit of a teary eye and he goes that was george grove and the kingston trio wants to record forever in a day he goes i can't believe the kingston trio wants to record one of our songs Yes. And a little while later, Uwe came, and when when Jens told Uwe what happened, Uwe had a little bit of a teary eye, tear joy, not not sorrow. But, no, no, it did. yeah. And and so the trio recorded it. It was on the uh, Born at the Right Time album, which was a fantastic album. I I still listen to it a lot. And at the camp, the what used to be the Kingston Trio Fantasy Camp, which is now the Americana Folk Gathering. Um, Saturday night, 
which was the end of camp, the Krugers were playing at the Music Instrument Museum. And when they got done with the concert, they came over to the Scottsdale Plaza Resort where um, the camp was, because they're only about 15 miles apart, and got persuaded to sit down in the lobby of the hotel and play some music. And when Jansen, Uwe, and, and Joel started playing Forever in a Day, everybody in the room started singing along. And it was well, a magical <laughs> moment, and there wasn't a dry eye in the place. That was, you know, we just, we, we came and we just wanted to say hello. And then, you know, at one point, you know, we said we got the instruments in the car. You know, why don't we come why don't we play one for everybody, you know, in the lobby. And and for us, you know, we didn't expect anything, you know. And that's usually when some of the magic happens, you know, when you don't expect it. And, and that moment was really, really to re be remembered, you know. I mean, we we were there. And it was interesting that, you know, when the Kingston Trio sings the song, they have more of a, the phrasing is a little different than what Uwe sings it. You know, it's just that the words, it's a little bit more folky, a little bit more out singing. It's this, it's this, there's a flavor to the phrasing, you know, that, that is typical for the Kingston Trio and for the folk era, really. And, and Uwe is singing it a little bit different, you know, and so everybody's singing it, but they're all singing it in the Kingston Trio version. You know, so, 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 so it's slightly, it has slightly, you know, shifts in timing, but it was absolutely amazing, you know, to, to hear all these people that we have never seen before. Most of them have never seen before. And they sing our song so loudly, you know, I mean, full throttle. And that's probably also a part of the camp. You know, you really teach people how to sing out and, and, you know, involve people with the singing and engage and, you know, not be introverted with it, and and so people really do, and yeah, it was it was an amazing amazing moment. There's a lot of people in the chat right now who were there yeah. that evening to who are sharing what you are talking about right now. Uh, a lot of people saying they were there, it was magical. What an amazing moment that was! Uh, so it definitely touched a lot of people. It seems like, and a few of them are here watching right now, which is which is really cool well, to see. There was. Yeah. Um, the camp is all people that were originally started coming to camp because of the Kingston Trio, and they're continuing to come with the Folk Legacy Trio and everything. But a huge number of the people that come to that camp have become absolute dyed-in-the-wall Kruger Brothers fans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they will all be at the concert on the 7th. Well, I have to say, I have to say, you know, I, I have to add to that, you know, because years ago you told me about the Kingston Trio camp. Greg, you know, when you when you went and and you said it's fantastic, it's beautiful, and it's and I said and then and I said to Uwe, Kingston Tree is making the camp. Why don't we do that? And why don't we make a music camp? And actually that idea came, you know, through through the through through the Kingston Tree, actually through Greg to us, you know, that we should do our own camp and you know, just make a weekend and, and and make it a little longer. And then we started it, and it's been now our eighth, I think, or ninth, you know, that we have coming up, you know. So, well, and some yeah. of the campers from the, this camp come to your camp. Yeah, absolutely. Like Alan Tuft and, you know, a lot of mm -hmm. people, you know, who've been, been around. And so uh, it's been a mutual, you know, great friendship, you know, amongst our people, <laughs> our tribes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, the camp is an absolutely wonderful vehicle for uh, musicians who aren't musicians who become musicians. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people began coming to the when it was the Kingston Trio Fantasy Camp because they'd been doctors or lawyers or, or CEOs or whatever their career had been. And when they graduated from college and began their career, they put their guitars and banjos underneath the bed. And that's where they lived for the next 40 years. Then they retired and said, what do I do with my time? Oh, I have a guitar and a banjo under the bed. I think I'll get those out and see what they sound like. And they started coming to the camp as a, as a vehicle in order to be able to play their instruments and play with other people that had uh, the same interests, which were primarily at that point, the Kingston Trio. So we would stand on stage. There were three of us in the trio and two of us would stand on stage with one of the campers and form a trio. Plus the name Kingston Trio Fantasy Camp, like a baseball fantasy camp. 
Um, then in 2017, when uh, Rick and I left the Kingston Trio and formed the Folk Legacy Trio, that's when the owner of the camp, Paul Reibolt, decided to change over to the Americana Folk Music Gathering. And instead of just Kingston Trio music, he decided that he would open it up to any kind of music whatsoever. So people bring in folk rock. They bring in um, groups like Fish. They bring in every singer, every songwriter you can possibly imagine. And we've expanded the staff so that we have not just a couple of guys from the Kingston Trio um, and the Folk Legacy Trio now with Jerry, but also uh, the guys that played in John Stewart's band. And John was a great songwriter. And he had wonderful musicians who played with him. And they've added their talents to the support of all the campers. Well, some of these campers have become such good musicians that they've formed their own groups. And they go out now and they play at retirement homes and they play at uh, uh, civic clubs all around. And they've become semi-professional musicians. What, what, what better thing to do with your life than, than to uh, share what you love with other people? Well, you know what what you're saying is so so true. You know, I I also Greg, you know, who's been running this company and you know being such a an amazing uh, entrepreneur. I can you know you know in in, in every aspect. Uh, you know, he plays banjo and he has a group. And uh, when we're going to be at the camp this year, you know, they're going to actually he's going to be with his group and they're going to open for us. You know, for the concert that we're going to play on Tuesday and and so. I think folk music, and you're going to talk more about that, Greg, please. But I think folk music is something. There's, a, there's, a, there's a beautiful. I, I sometimes like to say that on stage. You know, I, I say, well, in classical music, you have to be a virtuoso, right? Because it's, it's mandatory. You got to be good. You know, you got to be really good. But in folk music, virtuosity is just an option. You know, uh, it's just optional. You know, you don't. You can sing. It's almost like musical tai chi. Right, you can do things very simple, but you put all your heart in it, and that's all it's ever going to do. Right, that's mm -hmm. that's that's all it's ever going to need. And uh, we learned that from our parents, from our mother. They were not professional musicians, but they sure made us feel well when they sang and played. And I think that's a gift that people can share by learning a few tunes. You know, they don't need to be many. You know, you 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 don't need a thousand jokes to to tell a good joke. You know. And that's the same with with a song. You don't need a thousand songs. You, you have a handful of songs that you that you like. Our father, he had a handful of songs that he could entertain people with. And once he had sung them, that was it. You know, somebody else's turn. But mm -hmm. but um, and, and I think you know anybody can you know pick up a banjo, strum a few chords, sing a sing a tune, and he doesn't need to be a great singer. Mm -hmm. You know, in in technical terms, was Bob Dylan ever a great singer? I don't know. You know, to, that would be arguable because it's optional. You know, in this in this kind of music, if you have a beautiful voice, well, so be it. But if you if you don't have that, it's okay. You know, you can still play, and everybody's going to sing along or have a good time. And sometimes Uwe, you know, my brother, he starts like "This Land Is Your Land" or something, you know, on a concert, and it's always astounding that the entire room will instantly sing along. I mean, they're mm -hmm. so happy to sing along. And I think this is almost an art, uh, just actually a cultural aspect in America that has to been, that has disappeared for too long. You know, it has to right. come back. And I think camps like this camp really bring back, you know, this treasure, you know, this American treasure of folk music where people can learn and, and, and then go out. That's the goal. Go out and sing for your friends or go to retirement homes and, and do that. My my aunt had a mandolin orchestra, and she did that. And then I asked, you know, where you know, why did you split up? And he said, we never split up. They all died. But, <laughs> <laughs> but so, <laughs> but you know, they had the time of their life. You know, well, there's a whole other aspect to the camp, um, and, it, and they're called the Bloodliners. And what that refers to is John Stewart's first album was called California Bloodlines yes, for the cover song on it, which is a fantastic song called California Bloodlines. So there's only room for 30 campers in the camp because you can't have 200 and get it done in a week. There's only 30 campers, but they all need an audience for the concerts they put on each night. So the Scottsdale Plaza Hotel has a lot of rooms and the rooms are av available 
at the reduced rate for just people who aren't campers to come and be there and get to go to the concerts and be part of the whole scene. And there'll be all oh, anywhere from 50 to 100 bloodliners there. Mm-hmm. And there's room for more. The bloodliners usually have a hospitality suite and they'll be up most of the night jamming and playing songs in the hospitality suite. So it's the, the whole event has a lot of different levels. So that's going to be the date. Yeah, let's talk, about, let's talk about this year's camp, right? It's uh, yeah. So it's coming up pretty quickly here. And there's yes. uh, a number of people who are going to be there as well. Shout out to yeah. Sue Keller, who is so, going to be the camp cheerleader right now. Yeah, it starts on the 8th. Um, the first concert is on the 9th. And it goes uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. But Jens' concert, uh, Jens and Uwe and Joel will be doing a concert it's on, on Monday Tuesday. night. On the seventh, it's on Monday, Monday night. Monday, yeah, Monday, night. Yeah, Monday. Monday. right? Seventh, so, right. the Kruger brothers are playing on the seventh of August. Where, Greg? At the Scottsdale Plaza Resort. Excellent. Yes. And at what time? Seven o'clock. And who is the astonishing band opening for them exactly. on that evening? <laughs> exactly. Who is opening? Well. I was fortunate enough to be part of a folk rock group when I was in college. And our last names were me, Deering, and our bass player was uh, Kent Learned. And we had two brothers, John and Tony Prim. And I don't know how the name came about, but people just started calling us Deering, Learned, and Prim Prim. (laughs) Sounds, Sounds like a children's book, doesn't it? (laughs) <laughs> Last year, uh, John and Tony and I played on Friday night at the camp. We're going to play again on Friday night. But our friend Kent, who we've all stayed good friends over all the decades, but Kent found his match and his mate, Jeanette, and they got married, and she was from Australia. So Kent lives in Australia. So last year, Kent couldn't make it over, but this year, Kent's coming over. So it's ah, going to be all full four original of lineup. It's be the first time all four of us have played together in fifty years. Yeah. Wow. So you 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 still you did you learn some new material or did you did you did you just really try to sort of revive everything you did? <laughs> we revived what we did, but um, Friday night we're planning on doing one of the songs that John and Tony wrote. Back way back in the day, yes, just an outstanding song. And then, if we have time, we're going to do another one that the whole group wrote. That's a, a little rowdy, and I'm a little rowdy myself. But I'm an amateur compared to John. So, and when all four of us together, Scottsdale, Scottsdale Plaza doesn't know what's coming. Yeah, that's great. I, I mean, you're going to need to. You know, <laughs> Ozzy Osbourne to shame. So, gonna be- are you gonna are you gonna play banjo or guitar, Greg? Uh, Monday night, I'm just playing the banjo. Oh, Friday yeah. night, I'll be banjo and guitar. Nice. Look at that! I love it. I love it. Do, right, do so, we know whether um, this is a revival of music or a survival of music? <laughs> <laughs> wow! Well, we're set. we're definitely not spring chickens anymore. <laughs> Stephen Rich in the comment just made me laugh out loud halfway through your thing. Says it sounds like a law firm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it sounds like a law. Yeah, like yeah, that's one of our campers. Much better. No, I I was just you know Greg asked us could we maybe open for you? Said, of course, I mean, that's going to be fantastic. You know, and you know the nice thing about these events, you know, where we play concerts and we're so many friends together. Everybody that comes new to the group, you know, is gonna is so they everybody's so inclusive, you know, in this in this music, you know. So mm-hmm. so people are always surprised, you know, they come into an event where there's so many people they sometimes they feel like ah oh, maybe I'm an outsider. But actually nobody is. You know, I've never seen mm-hmm. that. And that's and that's just um, that's just marvelous. Well, I'm that's seeing... the one thing I like is is the fact that Jens and you and Uwe and Joel can go into a camp like that and and you know blend in basically even though your musical styles are vastly different on the spectrum yeah. of things yeah sorry george yeah. 
Well, I'm seeing a lot of names that are popping up over in the comments section that are campers. But mm -hmm. the, the fact that they are campers, I think, is insignificant to the fact that we have all become friends because of the music. Yeah. Agree more. Couldn't agree yeah. more. Well, I'm going to throw a link uh, just for, if anyone who is interested in picking up tickets to it. I'm going to throw links into the chat just for everyone to uh, to grab. Now. And actually, uh, actually, may, may I ask on Tuesday? May I add? Not ask. May I add on Tuesday afternoon? Uh, we're going to give a banjo workshop. You know, as I understand. You know, uh, so between two and five at the Plaza Hotel. You know. So when you say we. Give, you no, we, you. no, 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 no. I said that wrong. We're gonna, we're gonna give a band workshop. You know, mm -hmm. each one gives an instrument. Joel's gonna give bass. I'm gonna give banjo lessons. Who's gonna get, give guitar lessons? Oh, cool. You know, and so that's gonna be a nice event. You know, so, so for three hours we give workshops. I'm gonna be one of your victims or students. Excuse me, students. <laughs> no, we could. Be, you could help me a little bit, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> be my sidekick, or I'm <laughs> yours. <laughs> because you know we, we have not said you know because i i admire george so much you know i he's such an amazing musician uh not just with the kingston trio but he's also a great arranger and uh, uh composer he knows so much about music and when we're together greg brought us together you know at nam show we would go eat together you know it, 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 uh, and so we would sit at the table and we would just getting into music and and it's just wonderful you know uh, i have a great story if we have time for me to tell it absolutely. Uh, about that absolutely um uh unique uh friendship we were going to dinner it was greg and janet and uh uh my cindy and her sister just a whole bunch of people but sitting at one end of the table was uh mark johnson uh mm -hmm. who's a great claw grass player tony trishka Jens Kruger and myself and uh, raised I raised the question once and this again taught me a lesson uh, I learned so much <laughs> from you Jens and I love this one I said uh, what does everybody do to warm up and I said I play um, scales you know from uh, open positions to close positions all the way up and down the neck i do the a major scale i do a harmonic minor i do a melodic minor and then tony trishka jumped in and he said well there's this old uh fairly unknown earl scruggs song that i used to warm up with and we could see out of the side of our uh, eyes we could see yens kind of scrunching up his face a little bit and he finally jumped in and he said no that's not how you warm up the way you warm up is you get up early in the morning you go to a room there's no coffee there's no computer there's no wife there's no friends there's nothing there but you and you create that's how you warm up you create did i say that <laughs> 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 You're it making sounds this like up. A, sounds like something Ian's would say. <laughs> oh my god! Oh god! I don't know. That that Ooh. was the 40th anniversary year when we had we had the big booth at Nam downstairs in Hall E, and we had Tony, and we had Mark, and we had yourself, George, and Jens, mm -hmm. all in for the whole for the whole show for the full, full four days. That was a, yeah. that was a fun time. That was great. that was that was great. Yes, yeah, Mark was teaching Clawgrass to anything that moved basically like, <laughs> and anyone that walked into the booth he was giving a lesson to whether they wanted to or not it was fantastic it was three of those days three yeah. of those days were spent trying to find a place to park though yes that's true yes and well, then the that, other they spent trying to get nights, out of the convention center one of the nights at that nam show because mark johnson had just gotten the steve martin award oh yeah um yeah that was the yeah that was that year yes we all got invited to dinner at steve martin's house which was an incredible event. And, and, you know, the Kruger brothers have been friends with Steve for a long time. And Steve Martin learned Clawgrass from Mark Johnson. So I got to be a fly on the wall that evening at Steve Martin's house, which was wonderful. But when we were driving back to Anaheim, we had our big Ford expedition, whatever, all of us in it. And I'm driving down Hollywood Boulevard and the Kruger's, and Mark, I'll get their instruments out and the windows are down and they start playing music. And every time we came to a stop, it drew a crowd. <laughs> and 
you couldn't plan an event like that. That was just an amazing experience to be driving a vehicle down Hollywood Boulevard with some of the finest musicians on the planet making music. Uh, the best. I had the best stereo in the world that night. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we had also we had some amazing times. You know, Greg and I, uh, and we, you know, years ago I would fly out to San Diego, and we would go to the company. You know, he would get me at the airport, and then we would go directly from the airport to the company. And what would I say, Greg? Can we can we look at the new word? Yes, and and can sleep is sleep, the new word? sleep is cancelled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sleep's canceled so sometimes we stayed all night we wouldn't even go back to the house you know and just build banjos and just do things you know yeah there was times when you'd be here for four days and we'd make three complete prototypes in four days yeah i know that's when we were young <laughs> but when you told me sleep was canceled i almost fainted but then i found out after his visits out here he goes home and sleeps for a couple of days <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. All, all in the name of making banjos better. Yeah, we try everything, you know. Nothing what, undone. <laughs> we're coming up on the top of the hour. A, a question I've got some questions from the from the chat here, but um real quick from the three of you, what are you all most looking forward to about uh Americana Camp um Americana music gathering, I should say, this year? The huge variety of music uh, that these campers bring in. There are 30 campers, and we'll be presenting um, just over 90 different songs. And to, to see them at the uh, morning and afternoon rehearsals, uh, and then, you know, and put the songs together with them, because that's the first time those of us in the staff will have been able to uh, put the songs together in a live fashion. With, with that person because right now I'm just sitting at home listening to a song and saying well I might play this I might do that might do banjo might play a nylon string guitar but then to do it on stage with them and then they up their game at the concerts that night and it's just like uh, professionals I mean real professionals taking the stage and mm -hmm. presenting a show of entertainment and music yep well, I, I'm just, go ahead no, I'll great. Just, yeah, Greg, you go. You're fine. I, I'm just delighted that we're continuing to have the show. For the, Paul Reibel is the one that's been organizing this and doing all the back story stuff, and he's the backbone of the whole thing. And the last couple of times, there's been a question mark about whether we're going to have it again. And Janet and I and our friend Bob Zink jumped on board to assist Paul however we could. And that made the difference to Paul to continue doing it. And, and it's such a wonderful thing that, that charges batteries and, and makes magic. And to keep it going is really important and valuable and, and special. And just that we get to have it again. Every year we get to have it is such a big blessing. And to have the Krugers there at the beginning of the week to kick the week off makes it even more special. Yeah, the Krugers appeared there uh, seven years ago as a tease for this year. <laughs> <laughs> is it been that long? Yeah. <laughs> is it, is it been, well, I, and I'm, you know, for me, it's, for me, it's a, a, you know, a first to be officially at the camp, you know, for, as a concert. And, and so uh, for us, you know, getting to a new place is we're going to play our music that we know. So, but for us to the most the biggest joy is always meet new people you know meet new friends mm. see new faces and you know maybe we get to play with a few people or you know just get to jam um sometimes you know you know that very well george you know you get to know people through music when you play a song with somebody you get to know them very instantly you know on a, on a very different way on, than when you would talk to somebody you know you play a song with each other and it's like an instant instant exchange of the truth and the truth you know in most in most everybody or everybody i would say that i meet is beautiful so um you know we have we have all kinds of fears and anxieties you know being together in groups and you know singing or being embarrassed or you know being but then all of a sudden you know if you if you sing you know together you you don't have to verbally exchange you 
you're on a different level together and and it becomes clear that we're not so different you know that we're very much alike and we can become friends very easily you know mm -hmm. with, with people and have deep connections and i think this is what we always look forward to especially also uve and joel you know they're good-hearted people and all, our sound mm -hmm. engineer peabody you know so and of course all the friends that we have seeing you george you know and greg and janet and uh, cindy you know and everybody uh, that that is a great privilege and joy mm -hmm. it kind of reminds me what you were just saying of uh when Greg and Janet had their 40th anniversary at the uh, the Star of India, the ship uh, mm -hmm. there in the harbor in San Diego. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we were, you know, music is another language like anything else. It's a language that, that you speak from your mind, you speak from your heart, and it and it and then it takes on a voice and speaks itself. And uh, we were backstage because that's the night that you presented Steve Martin with his uh, Banjo Hall of Fame award. And... So we're all backstage, Steve Martin and you and Uwe and Joel and me. And you guys were speaking English. We're all joining in a conversation. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, y'all slipped into German. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then out of nowhere, you slipped into music. And they were all different languages, but they brought it. The music brought everybody together. Yes. It was, it was, that, that was a remarkable day anyway. You know, that was... That was a very spectacular day. You know, Jamie, uh, Jamie Daring, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, organized that entire event. And I remember yeah. her, you know, I remember her, you know, being a little, uh, how do you say, on her toes, you know, in the afternoon because there was a big storm coming through. And uh, do you remember we had to have fans everywhere, like the whole ship, all three levels. There was just fans blowing to try and clear out the the moisture and the humidity. And everything. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But but we were all, we were all, it was, it was very moist and hot, you know, and after... But it was beautiful. I mean, there was so much energy, good energy, you know, on that ship. You know, that was a yeah. great idea, you know, that they did that Star of India, you know. So that's, yeah, that's and it was the, actually the first time we got to play together, George, I think. That's right. Uh, we, forever and a day. You know, and, yeah, we, we played that. And uh, you say, yeah. yeah. And I Which, think we did Tom Dooley also, didn't we? Tom Dooley, yes. Uwe yeah. asked you, Uwe asked you, because, you know, when we were in Boy, Boy Scouts, you know, in Switzerland, we had, you know, these camps in the summer that we would go all summer mm -hmm. long. And uh, we had a songbook, you know, of course it was German all, you know, no, there was no English English songs in there. But there, there was a version of Tom Dooley in German. Mm -hmm. You know, so we we grew up with the song, you know, the Kingston Trio version of, you know, but the melody of the Kingston Trio with German words. And then, you know, so Uwe, you know, when, when at the Star of India, he, he approached you right away and said, you know, will we sing, you know, uh, 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 um, Tom Dooley together? And you said, of course. And I went to Uwe, how could you just go up to him and ask him? <laughs> <laughs> he sung that song a million times, you know, why you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, 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 that does segue quite beautifully. And speak of the devil, Jamie Deering is walking right in front of me as we speak. The organizer of the Star of India ship. Uh, yes, Hi, Jamie. Yes, How's it going? Yes, yes. Um, Sue Keller asks, uh, any chance George and Jens, and read my mind, take the stage together at the camp? What do you think, guys? You want to you wanna put something together at the camp and uh, jump in on some action there? We might have to talk about that. All yeah. Right. Well, like yes, um, I've already got a request from Tony Prim. And his wife Jesse, they would love to hear you guys Monday night do the song from the movie. Oh God, yes, <laughs> okay, that's what you yeah. get. You know, that's. <laughs> they, they that's have okay. to see an old video of you guys doing that, and uh, put a big smile on their face. Well, we'll <laughs> we'll, we'll see what we can do. Okay. Uh... <laughs> I know you haven't done it in a long time, but I just had to put that in. That's right. That's right. Well, what what a, what a delightful hour that was. It me. was. It was. It was. I, I loved it. It was. Uh, it was fascinating stuff. Um, any closing thoughts from anybody before we before we jump out of here? I'm gonna hit well, George. George. That, I'm Greg that, first. that wants to go to the concert the during. We have links to the buying the tickets. There's still plenty of tickets left. Mm -hmm. um, the the camp is donating the, the the venue to the Krugers, so there's no expense there for them. And Janet, Bob, and I are not taking any profit of it. So all the um, 
above everything above just a minor few expenses is all going to the Krugers. So support the Krugers and and uh, let's let's get as many people there at the concert as we can. I want to write them as big a check as we possibly can. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no. Right. I wish you could stick around uh, afterwards, uh, Jens, because uh, the my group, the Folk Legacy Trio, is given a concert Sunday uh, after the camp. I know, but the thirteenth. Yes, but I'm already at, at in Canada. I think at that moment, you know. Yeah, I know you're involved, but uh, yes. I would have asked you on our stage. Oh, that would that would have been beautiful. <laughs> but maybe on Monday night you can join us for a song. Will you? I'd love to. Will you? That, oh, that, there you go. I mean, that that would be that would be uh, that would be fantastic. You know, I mean, we'll do it. Okay. And then on That's... Tuesday, when I come to your master class, you can teach me what I should have played the night before. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> oh come on, you're, you are too nice. I'm, I come to lessons to you how to be a better person. You know that's, that's good. <laughs> no, so no, no, this is nice. This is great. No, my thoughts is I'm looking forward for this. Uh, you know, this is a different event because it's uh, it's connected to the to the camp. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so the concert is, is going to be is, is going to be different. As I've been a lot of friends, lots of lots of you know t uh, social uh, togetherness, and um, so that's that's going to be beautiful. And I, you know, thank you for letting me be part of this uh, conversation today. Same here. Thank pleasure. you very much. Thank yeah. all of you. Yeah, no, truly, you, the three of you, thank you for your time. Thank you for your understanding and, and patience as we got it all set up. And yeah. that, was, that was a really, really nice uh, hour. And even Uwe Kruger is watching. And uh, <laughs> hey, Uwe, he's leaving comments. Uh, uh -huh, Uwe, yeah. Uwe at one point wrote me, he said, you're, you're sounding good. You look okay. So I got my brother's approval, so it's good. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, guys, listen, thank you so, so much for your time today. Uh, yeah. Everybody at home, i got to give a quick shout out to my kids because I just got pictures of them apparently watching me <laughs> and us. So hi, John. Hi, Margo. Love you. Lots to see you in about half hour. Uh, but um, everyone who watches this after the show uh, on a repeat, uh, thank you for tuning in and leave your comments. And, and uh, thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you for hosting so well. I think we did okay, didn't we? I you think did we survived. Fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Sometimes when I go solo without Dave, I feel a little bit like no, you know, I'm going to fail. But, you know, you're Dave's the best. my anchor and he's not here. You're, you're the best. You're the <laughs> yeah, best. that hour went by in a heartbeat. Yeah. 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 Did. Did Jamie, good. tell the... Uh, it was nice to have met you the other day as we mm -hmm. first our first time meeting. Oh. And uh, please tell the beautiful Jamie that I said hello. That would not be me, right? That's the other Jamie. Just checking. The one that just walked past. All right. Got you. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Yep. I'll keep that in mind next time. Yeah. Enjoy okay. it, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> I will. You all take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.